When Granter announced its best young British novelists in 2003, one of their number was David Mitchell, who had impressed with the interwoven stories of his debut ghostwritten and earned a Booker Prize shortlisting with his next book, Number Nine Dream. Mitchell delivered on his promise the very next year, with a novel that showcased his virtuosity once again, but tied it to a structure so elegant it has often been compared to a Russian doll. And another Booker shortlisting followed. A novel which tells multiple stories over time and connects them all is no easy feat. So when I sat down to talk with him, I wanted to know not only how he had constructed it, but where such a concept had come from. This is how we made Cloud Atlas. It's a good question, where do books begin? Um... Maybe like rivers, uh, they've there are competing sources, or there are many sources. Um, certainly, an, an 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 early one I was reading "If on a Winter's Night" a traveller by Italo Calvino, and as you may or may not know, that's a book which keeps beginning. Um, there's there's a second person narrator, sort of you, and you find uh, a book and you start reading it and it's in a particular style from some point in uh, the history of and geography of literature. And it's really good, and it goes on for about three or four pages, five or six pages maybe, and then stops because something in, in, in your world causes you to stop reading the manuscript. Maybe uh, it just runs out, or maybe you put the book down and you're pulled off in a different direction. Um all very postmodern, uh, quite a lovely book, um, and it left me feeling a little bit, a little bit hollow, a little bit flat. Uh, I wanted more of the story. I wanted, I wanted to go back to the interrupted narratives. It does this about, if memory serves, about eleven, twelve times in the mm. course of this short novel. Um, and I got to the end of it, and I thought, yeah, fine. Uh, I've never read anything like that full marks of postmodern originality, but there was this but. It's like a meal where you only ever get the starters and you're never allowed to move on to the main course, <laughs> which might be a nice way to eat. I mean, uh, that might be a nice way to eat. But uh, um, I wanted the resolutions of, of, of it's, it's this potential energy had been generated by the beginnings of the books, uh, of the stories, but, um, but, but, but it had never been realised in the fulfilment of those stories. So... I just thought to myself, reading that aged uh, university, I think aged nineteen twenty, what would it look like if, if 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 the endings were put in reverse order or in Russian doll order, which is a word that comes up cloud atlas a lot, uh, if, and the ending was actually the middle, and then you worked your way out uh, to the end, which is actually the resolution of the very first story. So I got the structure by putting a mirror at the end of. Um, if I'm a Winter's Night Traveller. So that's one idea. Then, once I had the idea for the structure, and uh, yeah, uh, this was 10, 11 years, I think, before I started writing the novel itself, maybe maybe a bit longer. Um, then once I had the structure, okay, well, what would the stories be? In the Calvino kind of half-skeletal master um, structure of the book, uh, there they're kind of random. Uh, he writes pastiches of, say, a Japanese novel. There's a pastiche of uh, a Chekhovian short story. There's a pastiche of something more Hemingway-esque. Uh, I, I appreciated the very different styles, so I wanted to emulate that stylistic gulf. Otherwise, sort of, why bother if it's just one continuous, undifferentiated suburb? Uh, of text. Uh, so I wanted different styles, but um, I also had the idea of moving through time. So the earlier ones would be in the past, the middle sections would be in the present, and the sections towards the end of this arc would be in the future. And that seemed to work. And then, of course, that would work nicely on your way out from the middle of the book. You'd be going first forwards in time and then backwards in time. Uh, I was young and I didn't know any better. Well, I mean, that's the truth of Claire. I'll just be coming back to this point again and again. I think. I think maybe if I had the idea now, uh, I, I'm just thinking, oh come on. I mean, this hasn't been done before, and it's probably really good reasons why it hasn't been done before. <laughs> but I was there, there's this sort of. I, 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 I think this is a common trait across the arts. You're young, 
you don't know what not to do. You're impetuous. You have this impetuosity of youth. And bizarrely, it can kind of compensate for expertise. <laughs> you see this more in music. Um, it's one reason why there's so many great first, maybe second albums in a band's career and why there's so, so very few acts that can keep making quality, innovative, successful work um, throughout a 20, 30 year career. Very, very few can do it. Um, mm. Lots of albums, there's lots of great one album bands, a few um, great two album bands, but three album bands, like real indisputable, great five star three album bands. There's, all, there's, there's just, it's just a handful. Mm. Uh, writing, fiction, letters are kinder uh they do have you you really do have a shouting chance of mellowing and improving with age like wine but um um but it's also true that when you're younger uh you just try things out and go for things because because you haven't been writing that long because you haven't um spent two and a half years on a book or longer and then run smack bang into this concrete Berlin wall you can't get around or over or under. Um, once you've done that a couple of times, you, you kind of you start to know better. You start to sort of <laughs> at least um, get an instinct for putting out feelers to see if this book's going to work or not, kind of before you put in those months or even years of writing it. I didn't with Claire Atlas. I wasn't at that point yet. Uh, yeah. I thought, yeah, there's this oddball structure. No one's done that. Let's give this a go, see what happens. <laughs> um, it, 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 it didn't occur to me that it probably wouldn't work. The Carvino thing was a starting point. Um, this impetuosity was what gave it momentum. Um, the idea that um, I'd work through time, okay, that meant writing the dialects of English because of course dialects exist in time as well as space. I knew enough to know at least if you're going to try to do that you'd better make that work because um, otherwise you really will have a uh, an, an ungodly mess on your hands. So uh, I modelled, uh, I read Melville for the Adam Ewing section, um, uh, I encountered him at university um, Obviously, uh, uh, great American maritime writers. Um, and so I combed through his short stories for usages that I just didn't know. Uh, a couple of other books as well. It's one called Two Years Before the Mast, a 19th century maritime sort of classic of sailing literature by a writer called Richard Dana. Again, Looking back, just the just 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 just, just the um, nonchalance with which I <laughs> went about this is quite breathtaking. I thought, okay, I read Melville. I do nineteenth century American dialect now. <laughs> Fine. What's next? Nineteen uh, thirties. <laughs> let's fast forward to that. Um, I mean, something I haven't said yet, which was originally it was going to be nine sections long: three in the past, three in the present, three in the future. Oh, well, that's okay. that's um, following a career long pattern of of conceiving utterly unwritable unwieldy monsters that would collapse like a black hole and the, the gravity of their own weight and hacking it down to um a just about handleable length a just about handleable cast um and still ending up with these big chunky novels that are quite slow to write, which means my payday is a few and far between. Uh, I should just write shorter books. I just I, I, every time I turn in a monster, my wife says, "Okay, well done, another five hundred pager." Um, what about just how about next time? Just do one hundred and eighty pages. It's, anyway, anyway, uh, that's a that's an aside. Um, what's next? Uh, Christopher Isherwood. Uh, I chose him for a model for um, for the nineteen thirties section. Sort of posh public school accented English. That's a slightly different dialect. Um, mm. Then the Louisa Ray one airport novel. Uh, I chose a. Um, uh, I think I read a few just um, that were hanging around um, the bookshelves at 
work. I at this point I was teaching English in Japan in uh, in, in 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 a sort of small local chain of language schools. Uh, obviously, English speaking teachers would come work for a year, maybe less, maybe longer, leave books and go. And many of these books were backpackers books, uh, just things you that they, they just drift through time until they eventually fall apart. I can't quite remember what those books were, but but um which is almost the point actually. Uh <laughs> that, that they weren't by um famous or necessarily literary writers. But 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 just that flat, no frills Hemingway esque, I suppose, Raymond Carver esque way of writing very short chapters, short sentences, leave out the adverbs, um, one adjective is fine, no need for much imagery, quite dry. Moving into the present, Timothy Cavendish, that kind of came, I suppose that didn't really need a model, that was, that, that was more for me. He's a, he's, he's a character in um, Ghost Written, he's a very minor character there but uh he he already he already existed and i uh knew what he sounded like then went to the future uh the korean section uh, i'd gone to korea for for a new year um for new year's break when i was in japan i took the boat uh to Busan in the south of the country uh i took a load of notes as i usually do when i'm traveling just things um Things I wanted to remember. It was actually for something else. I was, I was, I, I had a different idea about um, kind of an early K-pop before the word almost rap, rap singer, um, based on a real life case that was in the news that caught my eye. Um, so I'd sort of gone for that, but um, that story slightly fizzled out, and I needed a new location. So I thought. Why not use my career notes for this? Um, I read Flowers for Algernon, which was um, uh, a book that's huge, I think, when it came out, maybe early seventies. It, it, it sort of, it was, it was the apogee of the um, of the of Skinner's behavioural ideas. Uh, th- th- these these notions that n- knowledge and maybe even wisdom is a question of training. It's a question of carrots and sticks and this is a book about someone who would now would call uh, extremely special needs uh who um and, and and of course it was written in an age that was besotted with iq as a reliable non-laughable measure of this thing we call intelligence um someone someone with a very low iq he had this magic drug and it raised his iq and and the writing changed uh, it, it's a first person narrative so he um, mm. it, it's a testament of this experiment uh and it was tested on a mouse first uh and so he, he he's, he's got an affinity with this mouse because he then becomes the human mouse uh and uh the iq skyrockets and the way it's and the language with which it's written um in which uh which, which which the protagonist uses um, also kind of moves up through the registers, becomes highly kind of educated, lots of high register lexicon and um, um, Proustian length sentences. Uh, then the mouse dies, and the kind of and okay, there's something wrong with the drug, and and and, and the um, and the language starts to revert to go back to where it went. Um, as you can tell from the way I'm talking about it sort of ideologically time would not have been kind to this book and it wouldn't have aged well however uh the phasing uh this sort of sliding switch like something you might see in a recording studio for the register of language for linguistic mm-hmm. register that was attractive that was really clever i thought and and done really well uh so some of the son me section it kind of or at least her relationship with language comes from that. Uh, I'd read a couple of Russian dystopias, uh, Yevgeny Zamyatin's We. Um, I said Russian, that was the only Russian, but but um, a couple of other dystopias as well. Uh, so I amalgamated those sources and got the Somni section. Interestingly, when I was when I was on book tour for Cloud Atlas, I tried reading from that section a couple of times and it fell absolutely flat. It works on the page, but... Yeah. but um, um, She's the the narrator is a 
genetically modified kind of server in a future fast food business. Uh, and I figured that she would need and only kind of be given uh, a very limited uh, vocabulary that I suppose a bit like my Japanese was at the time. Uh, uh, <laughs> basic grammar and vocabulary and the set phrases you need to um, function in your particular job, which which for Somni was uh, was this fast food restaurant underground, so she never sees the sun or the world or realises that there is any world really outside this little unit that she's been created for. Um, her relationship with language then, uh, a little bit like that in the protagonist, uh, that of the protagonist in Flowers for Algernon, that... Um, mm. Uh, that all fed into that section. Uh, then for the future, um, that I'd, 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 I'd read um, Ridley Walker by Russell Hoban, mm. um, certainly his masterpiece, uh, set in a post apocalyptic, long post apocalyptic Kent, where the survivors don't really have much memory of, or, or, or they only have ancestral memory of presumably the Third World War, that reduced England and presumably the world to this um, early medieval um, level of everything. The language in that resembled the world. It was just a hodgepodge of archaicisms, of neologisms, of abbreviations, of portmanteau words, of uh, mangled phonetics. Of course, mangled by our standards, but not by their standards, which is yeah. one of the points. It's a great novel, uh, and it takes about 10 pages to get your eye in on the language. But once, you, but once you've done that, it's, it, it works really well. And, and, and it's kind of effortless to read as well. Um, uh, not quite effortless, but, um, but amply rewarding of the effort it asks you to put in. Mm. Uh, my protagonist in Cloud Atlas, Zachary. Um, Zachary speak is not as hardcore as Ridley speak, but uh, that book did serve as a model of um, what you can try and what works and what can be really good. And 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 you can kind of make accidental poetry uh, if you invent your own dialect like this. Um, so so I did that. Um, he's in Hawaii. Uh, I went to Hawaii with. Uh, my, um, actually, my wife on uh, on a kind of a pre honeymoon, uh, and um, paid attention to I suppose how people spoke there, the way that um, it's well, any melting pot, any ethnic melting pot, also becomes a linguistic melting pot. Mm. Um, so there's a mixture of Hawaiian slang that I just got from the back page of Lonely Planet. Mm. This was the trip advisor, and we still used paper guidebooks. Um, and I was also teaching, I was teaching English to engineering students, um, pretty basic level. Um, some instances I transposed the, um, the common mistakes and errors that Japanese speakers of English would deploy because of, um, interference from Japanese and its structures and its mannerisms, um, in English onto um, Zachary speak onto how mm. um, onto how he, onto how he talks. So uh, that, in a very very big nutshell, that we couldn't possibly call a nutshell because it's large, much <laughs> larger than any known nut, uh, is uh, the genesis of the six sections of Cloud Atlas, uh, which in turn went on from your very innocent short. Uh, question: How did Cloud Atlas begin? That's far more. Yeah. That's more. That's far more info than you need, really, isn't it? Well, sorry. And that is the end of the episode. <laughs> I tell you, but what I'm saying, because obviously the sections that are in the past, you sort of um, expect authors to do historical research when they're looking at those sort of uh, periods yeah. from the past. And then, of course, as you say, the, the periods that are closer to the present are much easier to write pr- from your own experience. And then you start to head into to the future. And you really have to start speculating about stuff. And I just wondered whether that makes those sections harder to write or does it make them easier to write because really you're inventing and are able to do what you want with them? Uh, That's a great question. Um, And it is really both at once. It's the future sections. uh, 
they can't be wrong. Uh, they can be bad, but they can't be wrong because they haven't happened. Uh, the past, I suppose, can be both wrong and bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think the hazard of the future is actually cliche. Uh, there are grooved in ideas of the future that we get from popular culture mm. um, and or even unpopular culture. Uh, and um, problem is trying to... Um, it's a bit like trying to write a song that doesn't sound like anyone else's song. The moment you start doing that, you start thinking of other people's songs. Similarly, writing a future that doesn't too slavishly resemble, or too obviously resemble anyone else's. Um, so uh, I suppose the strategy with cliche avoidance is the moment you notice it, you do the opposite. Mm. Uh, or you use the cliche and subvert it and change its angle so that it, looking at it from a different from a different viewpoint uh that's a tricky bit with writing futures i find the language however that sort of helps um almost accidentally cloud atlas also became a book about language about how it evolves through time yeah. um I, it's it, it it isn't that i have uh, kind of a great fund of knowledge or research to boast of in this area. I don't, but um, but by default almost, if you assemble six slabs of writing, uh, 12 slabs of writing, I suppose, because you're halving each one and line them up next to each other, you get this other narrative about the mutation and evolution of language through time and space, uh, which is kind of cool. It's a cool free gift that... <laughs> that the structure gave me. I also had this idea of every narrative being contained in its predecessor. So the journal is read by someone who then writes the letters mentioning this journal. Uh, these letters then become an artefact in the Lu in the Louisa Ray story. Uh, the Louisa Ray story becomes um, an, an unfinished manuscript, uh, raising an ontological problem about whether... It, whether or not it really happened, which at some point I have to resolve in my Mitchell verse thing, but um, <laughs> never mind. I'll come back to that in the future and fix it, um, etc. Uh, each form is contained um, as an artifact in in the narrative that houses it. So again, without uh, th 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 this is a byproduct rather than in, an intention. It, it, it's something I saw happening as I wrote the book, rather than. Uh, something which was in some genius master plan at the beginning. It, it, it all came as uh, a product of the structure. Um, so uh, lots of things happen in the book, which are sort of decided by the novel as much as they were decided by me. Once I saw they were there, I could then work with them, and I did, and 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 um, utilize them as theme. And, and and as ideas of the book, but a lot flowed just from that idea for the structure. So what were the themes you did have in mind at the outset? In a word, predacity. Um, it's full of units preying on other units, tribes preying on tribes, uh, ethnicities preying on other ethnicities, um, societies preying on individuals, individuals preying on individuals. Uh, each of the six sections, um, each of the six sections has its own pattern of predacity unique to it. So I suppose the novel also became a, uh, an, an, an exhibition of different types of predation or predacity. If you talk about one thing, you also talk about its opposite uh, because a thing is defined by its opposite and usefully for novelists because it gets to be quite interesting many things have m multiple opposites um and one opposite of predacity is, is is this thing which from uh ancient poetry to pop songs to what we say to the people who are closest to us is, is this thing we call love mm. uh and what is this stuff uh what is it <laughs> uh um and one way of answering the question is to say, well, okay, what's its opposite? Uh, presumably, its opposite is 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 the the 
abnegation of the well-being of people in your orbit and further afield, um, which means love is the protection of the well-being of people in your orbit and people further afield. Um, and from these opposites, I just, I guess, had a a kind of a vision, um, uh, 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 not in the mystical sense, but 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 just in the plane of ideas of of, of this vast loom, this vast net. Of course, this isn't a, um, original. Many human beings who've ever given any thought to this field at all uh, would have uh, shared this image with me. Um, and I'm interested in repercussions. Um, if 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 uh, this this will make me sound um, visibly pompous, but if I was a character in a Japanese anime and I wanted to uh, and I wanted to do a background story on me, then I'd have this little episode, and it it, it just comes from my dad. Uh, he he's when he was a kid. He went to, um, he was taken to India by his dad, my grandfather, who was a tailor, who was, uh, he got a job as a supervisor in India making uniforms for the army, I think. Uh, so they went out just, I think, at the end of the phony war, so about kind of 1940s. My uh, history isn't that exact. Um, and on the way back, um, it was a ship called the SS Cairo. It went back through um, Suez, I think. And on the way back out, it was torpedoed and sank. Uh, and um, I don't know the casualty figures, but I think there were, uh, but I think they were high, and not many were saved. Um, and that just that always stuck with me. Uh, if my dad had been on the next ship out. I wouldn't exist. Mm. Um, that 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 that's that's that's. If, if you, if I'm an idea and you open me up and you find my heart and you open up the heart and you and and and, and there's a container inside it and you open up that container, then then there's this idea in the middle of it of just repercussions, just the causal link, um, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect that's what existence is made of uh in this view of it uh and and it's it's there pretty much in everything i write uh even when i don't want it to be it rears its head again it's it's one of my archetypal themes um, <laughs> the causality and uh i can't really tidy this into, in, into a beautifully polished sentence for the podcast but um <laughs> but sort of all of this and more, and much, much more, as Sue Pollard used to say in Heidi Hyde. That dates me. Uh, no, it wasn't Sue Pollard. It was the um, it was it, 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 it was the Welsh yellow Ru- Ru- Ruth, Ruth Maddock. Maddock. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> that ages me as well. <laughs> and much, much more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, so all of that and much, much more is in Cloud Atlas. Uh, that archetypal theme. Certainly it's where this archetypal theme of causality kind of first gets centre stage. You know, it's not a side theme. It gets it's right up there at the top of the bill. I really didn't think Ruth Maddock was gonna make an appearance <laughs> in this conversation, but there we go. <laughs> When it was finished and and you sort of sent the book in to to be published, were you sort of confident that you pulled it off? Were you confident that you were making progress from your previous books? Did you expect it to to have the kind of success that it then went on to have when it was published? Oh, heavens no. Uh, No. When I sent it in, I think it was the last paper manuscript I ever sent in, uh, posted it to my agent, I mean, two copies, one to my agent, one to my editor. Um... I think at the end of the week, we're living in Ledbury. Our daughter had just been born. I posted it off and I was a nervous wreck. I thought, well, 
you know, it's great. Number nine Veeam got shortlisted for the Booker, but that's it now. I've I've, I've just blasted my foot off. Uh, <laughs> that 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 is the end of my career. That's it. It's over. Uh, I was. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not embroidering this well. I, I was really worried that my agent would say, what? Uh, <laughs> and I kind of get arrested by the literature police and I'd have to give my shortlisting back to the booker because they, <laughs> they, they'd, they'd seen through me for the, for the utter imposter that I really was. Uh, I really thought all of this. Um, so I, I was I was really hard to live with that weekend, I think. I was just a nervous jumpy preoccupied wreck uh until uh yeah I, I i got a very welcome phone call after the weekend from my uh agent jonathan pegg uh and i could tell from his voice that he really enjoyed it and uh and thought it worked and and uh all the nervousness and anxiety i had just was transmuted by alchemy uh into relief uh, just the, that that blissful relief, that gratitude that, okay, maybe I'm still a novelist. Then things kind of snowballed from that. I got some uh, great feedback from Carol Welsh at Scepter, who is still my editor. Um, lucky me. <laughs> and really, uh, she's great. So great, in fact, that when I spoke to editor Carol Welsh, she was keen to say how much of the work had been done by Mitchell himself by the time he submitted the manuscript. She shed some more light on the themes and ideas contained within the book. I think I remember with Cloud Atlas that he um, talked me through it in great detail. We have several times had very, very long conversations where he gives me a blow by blow account of the plot and uh, in, in great detail. And um, I think somewhere I've got handwritten notes uh, about Cloud Atlas from that. So I, I. What I can't tell you is when at what stage that was, but I had a pretty good idea of what it was going to be. And then what I have found is um, I obviously asked him not long before he actually delivered it for a synopsis so that I could start briefing the jacket. And it's it was very close to when he, you know, he'd, he'd pretty much finished it. So it was very accurate. But, um, but it was quite fun looking back at that and seeing um, how you know, it was all so well thought out and planned. So when I actually received the script, as I say, I knew more or less what was coming, um, but obviously without having read an actual word of it. Well, in fact, I, I, I replied saying, how I'm going to condense that into five lines for a <laughs> jacket brief, I don't know, but I'll have a go. <laughs> <laughs> I did find my cover brief, and I, I, I was quite pleased with myself because I, I said um, that it needed to look groundbreaking, intriguing, and big, culty but not off-puttingly esoteric. I was able, also, of course, to explain some of the themes because David had also gone into those. Partly the sense of um, connectedness, and I know that that. Um, was something that he didn't necessarily uh, want to be overt, but but thought that some readers might pick up on the idea that actually um, this is one soul reincarnated in different eras and uh, centuries. The will to power, um, caste and hierarchies, tribalism, uh, exploitation, those were the sort of uh, core, I suppose, core themes that came across to me. Picking up on that expectation is CEO of Hodder and Stoughton, Jamie Hodder-Williams, who also has some thoughts on the appeal of the extended Mitchell-verse. Right from the beginning, there was quite a big expectation that David's next book was going to be a bit special. And I think Car I think that must be because David and Carol had discussed what it was going to be like and what it was going to cover. So, so we, so I think there were, within the publishing house there was always an expectation that Cloud Atlas was going to be exciting. But when it arrived, Carol, uh, uh, Carol's quite understated, and she's very influential about how she talks about the books to us. 
but she doesn't always she doesn't always rave in a sort of incredibly loud way she just quietly makes it really clear when she thinks a book is incredibly special and she did that with cloud atlas and then the sort of the publicity and marketing people are sort of the opposite they um <laughs> they they really do you know they really find ways of of shouting about a book i suppose and and that's what happened with cloud atlas um that when it came in carol was quite quietly influential about it and told everyone what an extraordinary book it was and and a few things about it and then and then some people in publicity and a couple of people called hannah and oriel and lucy and sales started talking about it but lots of us read it really at the same time because carol you know because we were expecting it so, so some books perhaps within the publishing house you come to quite late but th- this was a book that a lot of people read very quickly and very quickly i think wanted to tell other people about because it was you know I, none of us had read a book like it um and i think that's yeah i suppose that as a publisher that's that's just so special when you have that uh, that kind of excitement we all love the little linking characters and the and the and the way it feels like you're reading a completely different book, but finding little um, windows into the other books that you've read already. And I think that's that's a David Mitchell world sort of that that a reader enters that's really special. Um, I, I, for for me, I love the fact that although he's seen as a very literary writer, he's also you know. Jacob de Zoot is really an adventure story and Black Swan Green's a coming of age novel and and he he's in many ways he's a speculative fiction writer and I love the kind of cross genre nature in fact I always think of it as David having worked in a bookshop and having sort of worked in all the different fiction sections and in fact and Cloud Atlas of course is experimenting with most of those um most of the sort of sections of a of a bookshop and I love I love the idea I'm I'm not sure that's why but I love the idea of David thinking oh I could write a 19 a, a, a 1950s American noir novel or a, yeah I I just I I don't know if that's how he works but I I love I think that there's there's a sense of he's writing about books and art and humanity and the sort of vastness of it and yet doing it with with characters and a cast of characters who you you know or you or you know that they're connected to other characters that you know. That bookshop analogy is particularly apt for David Mitchell, who used to work at the Canterbury branch of Waterstones. His manager there was bookselling stalwart and author of the bookseller's tale, Martin Latham. Well, yeah, I hired him in 1990 when we opened, and he was the first fiction buyer. And I was trying to remember last night why I appointed him as fiction buyer. And it sounds pretty obvious in retrospect, because he is such was always such an eclectic thinker, and speaker but vivid actual memories and I spoke to somebody recently before this little chat who also worked with him and we both agreed that he talked to customers um, at always in depth and at length and often regardless of the queue behind but nobody seemed to mind because as you know he's got this he's got a certain charm he's like a storyteller some sort of a shamanistic storyteller so he'd be in the corner talking to customers about Camus and Borghese I mean, the person who worked with him, Vicky, says, remember as in being, she emailed me, languid and sophisticated, all long fingers and limbs and playing the guitar um, and seemed to cut above the rest of us. But I think uh, because he co-owned his own home, tiny flat in uh, Whitstable. But I remember his gentleness, his conversationalness, his extraordinary command of language. Uh, we went for a night walk on Whitstable Beach once when he'd broken up with um, someone, I think, and he was just so eloquent about his own grief. Um, it's that command of language which you hear, which he had, even in the quite stressful situation of a bookshop. Obviously, I didn't know he would become quite so extraordinarily, uh, not just successful, but almost genre genre busting. Um, but Tim Waterstone came and gave little reports on everyone in his tiny handwriting, and he gave a little, wrote a little report on David Mitchell, which I've still got, which says, nice young man, not as clever as he thinks he is, <laughs> which is funny. And Tim wouldn't mind me quoting that because he did come across as extremely clever and eclectic. And it, it was clear he would do something. And it was clear that wouldn't be necessarily something academic. Um, he loved meeting the authors we had in those early days. The shop was opened by A.S. Byatt and we did successive events with her. 
And I think they really clicked. And I think Possession was quite an inspiring, shape-shifting story at that time. So, yeah, he was clearly going to write, but who would have known it would be just that eclectic? But that's why I think the bookshop helped. There's a bit too much of a division between town and gown and academia and retail, and he didn't feel that division. He still loves bookshops and and people. I think I watched Cloud Atlas last night before this just to refresh my mind, and I thought, yeah, that he's a student of all sorts of human nature and that informs his books and that was something which got full play in a bookshop where he could talk and open up all sorts of people and um yeah it was just a great phenomenon and it, i didn't know what a nationally successful book it was until Wartstone started promoting it where it was on their main banner in the window and it really took off and it what was nice about it and is still nice about it is like number nine dream it's a book that grabs all sorts of readers, young people, science fiction readers, literary readers. And that was what was great about it, I think. There was one reader whose early response was particularly noteworthy for David himself. My mum liked it. Uh, I remember, I think at, at some point we moved over to Ireland shortly after I'd handed it in. Uh, we got settled here. My mum came to see me. By that point, yeah, uh, the proofs were, were ready. So I'd sent her a proof and... She enjoyed it. I mean, she 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 uh, we spoke about it, but uh, she was sort of here to see us rather than to talk literature, I guess. So we didn't really speak about it till I drove her back to uh, the ferry, and I remember it was just a bright morning, it was one of those beautiful mornings Ireland can pull out of the hat for you, and 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 she just said how um, how much she really liked the book and. This will sound quite vainglorious, and maybe it's a bit too personal for a podcast, but I'll say it anyway. Let the chips fall where they may. Uh, she said, I think it'll make you famous, Dave. And I, I thought, oh, bless. Oh, oh, my mum. Oh, thanks, mum. And, 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 and she said, no, 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 really. And she's a big reader, is mum. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, and, and you know, fame, it's relative, it comes and goes, it's very, very, and, and, and I, occupy a small niche you know the literary novel this is my turf it's a small niche in in a pretty small niche the novel uh in this niche of books uh in in the art so it it, it it honestly hasn't gone to my head but it was a really <laughs> sweet thing for her to say and i thought it was just a sweet thing but kind of more than any other book that i've ever written uh uh, what she said about it was more applicable to Cloud Atlas than anything else I've written. What do you think she meant by that? What did she mean? Um, maybe it's relative uniqueness. Uh, many books kind of look quite a lot like a number of other books. You could, it, it's quite easy to say, and, and, and this is useful shorthand in the publishing world, sort of uh, this book is a cross of this with a bit of that with a dash of this, and it gives you kind of a usable shorthand um, picture in an editor's meeting about future acquisitions, for example, um, yeah. or, or if you're writing reviews. It's kind of hard to do that with Cloud Atlas. Uh, yeah. Kind of what is it like? And the fact that I'd written that and it was a um, – it was an well, – it shouldn't be a dirty word, but an, an accessible reading experience. Uh, maybe, maybe Mum was talking about the combination of those two. Um, it, it sort of has this philosophical, almost spiritual edge. Uh, and and I, I I know this sounds like humble braggery, but it it comes more from the book, not me. It just comes mm. from the logic of having gone where where a, a small number of decisions I'd made right at the beginning led me. Uh, uh, it, so the book has these dimensions that you might not associate with something that's apart from the middle section and maybe the first section. It's, it's fairly easy to read as well. Um, mm. it, it's, 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 it's not a sort of, a, uh, I'm reading Ulysses right now as it happens. It's a lockdown project and, and, um, you know, in 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 more ways than one, Cloud Atlas is not Ulysses. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe that's actually a very relevant thread to follow out of this labyrinthine discussion I've mired us in. Uh, this this is, is perhaps is why the book found 
and still finds the um, the audience that it has done. I expected absolutely none of this, none of it. That isn't humble braggery. Uh, I, I, I was just hoping that uh, that uh, it wouldn't put my it would lose me my agent and my publishers, and they'd still want to publish me after this nut job of a novel I'd spent <laughs> two or three years on, and 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 had to hand in because I didn't have a sane substitute. And because, as you may have gathered, he really is a humble chap, we shall give the final word to his long-standing editor, Carol Welsh, who is clear about why she likes working with him so much. He's the loveliest man in the world. Um, universally adored for good reason. Uh, he, he's, he's your ideal writer. He's so, first of all... Uh, creative uh in the most uh exciting ways he's um modest he hasn't changed in that respect at all um appreciative responsive to editorial suggestions he never takes umbrage um he's not precious but he also knows their mind and that's what you want you don't want you know, you don't want a writer to, it's rather disconcerting if they do everything you suggest. Um, <laughs> so, no, he's an absolute delight to work with. He, he, he would admit, the one thing he's not very good at is meeting deadlines. And <laughs> also because he's the, the, the man he is, he doesn't like to admit that he's not going to make the deadline until <laughs> it's very late in the day. Um, but that's my only <laughs> that's my only criticism Cloud Atlas is available in paperback together with David Mitchell's backlist including his most recent novel Utopia Avenue another expertly crafted addition to the Mitchellverse which transports the reader back to late 60s London and the brief brilliant career of its eponymous psychedelic rock band let's hope not too many deadlines slip by before we get to read the next book Huge thanks to all who helped to make this episode possible. The music you heard was the Cloud Atlas theme from the film adaptation by Johnny Climack, Reinhold Heil and Tom Teichver, adapted for piano and played by Mark Fowler. How We Made will return soon with the story behind another landmark book, but our next podcast will come from our other series, This Is The Book, in which we get to hear about the next exciting publication from indie superstars, Galley Beggar Press. See you then. <laughs>